We are right at right at time. So a few folks are still filtering in, but we will get started and let them catch up. Um, welcome to our 2022 Plant Healthcare webinar series. Um, you're here with Rainbow EcoScience. Um, just want to give a quick update um, for those of us those of you who know us, Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements um, has rebranded to Rainbow EcoScience. So just if there's any confusion there, same us, just a different logo, slightly different name, just to encompass um, who we serve in the green industry. Quickly, a safety briefing before we get started. For those of you just have a gander around your offices or your home offices, make sure that there aren't any trip hazards. If there's inclement weather in your area, please know how to respond. For those of you who may be driving, please make sure that you're parked in a safe location or you just have us in a way where you can hear us and you don't need to be worried about um, us distracting you from your driving. I'm just gonna intro myself, even though I'm not the one giving the talk. I'm Allison Harrell. I am the West Coast Arborologist. So thank you for those of you um, who are from basically the front range west to the West Coast. I am your technical advisor. Uh, my contact information is here if you should need any uh, support for technical support or questions after the webinar. So if you need that, you can find it on the website or it's just written right there. Housekeeping, please type uh, your questions into the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom, it says Q&A. Type your questions there. We will address those at the end of the presentation. I will help moderate those for Dr. Davis. The webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out. The webinar is worth one CEU. If for any reason you did not enter your ISA certification number when you registered, please type that into the Q&A box so we can make sure that you get credits, but you should have had the opportunity to put your certification number in when you signed up. And then I need to say this now so I don't get in trouble. Um, we will put the CEU code up at the end before the questions. Um, we can't put it up until after the talk is completely done, so I apologize about that, but you don't actually need it. We are going to get the CEUs for you. That would only be for your records to have that CEU code, so just FYI. All right, without further ado, we've got Dr. Seth Davis. He is the Assistant Professor of Forest and Woodland Entomology at Colorado State University. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, he's got an abundance of information for us, and... I will let him introduce himself further if he feels like there's anything else that he needs to hop in. Oops. Thanks, Allison. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and uh, go into a screen share here. I think you may need to, yeah, there we go. Okay. So can I just verify good. that my screen is up? Yeah, I'm good. Yep, looks good and sound is good. Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone. So yeah, I'm a um, faculty member at Colorado State University, uh, specialty in forest entomology, but really end up working on uh, all kinds of insects, including scale insects. So today we'll talk about the life cycle, ecology, diagnostics, and management of some common West Coast scale insects. Uh, so brief outline of the talk. First, we'll just go over some introduction to the taxonomy and basic ecology and life cycle scales. Uh, we'll go over some common pest insects in Colorado, but these are uh, really applicable to the entire West Coast. And then go over some basic um, uh, control options for scales, including cultural controls uh, and chemical controls. Um, so, first, to begin with some of the ecology and life history, scales are sap feeding insects in, in the order Hemiptera, so they're actually true bugs. Um, you can see from this diagram that they're a little more evolved than white flies and a little less evolved than aphids. Uh, there's about 50 to 80,000 species of true bugs, including things like cicadas, aphids, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, uh, and scales. And they're in this group, the Coxoidea, which is about 50 million years old. And their larger group is the Sternorhynchia. So are you able to uh, see my uh, pointer on the screen here? Um, yes. Okay, good. good. Just if I'm pointing at things, I wanna be sure people can see that. So the Sternorhynchia actually refers to a suborder uh, of insects with rear-facing mouth parts relative to the head. 
So the stylet faces away from the head rather than forward or directly out, and that affects the way that they feed. True bugs are hemimetabulous, meaning they do not actually go through full metamorphosis. So here's a comparison of the life cycle of uh, true bugs on the left and um, uh, polymetabulous insects on the right. So these have your typical egg larvae pupae adult life stage, whereas nymphs uh, or whereas uh, true bugs just progress through several nymphal stages, which are usually wingless, and then they gain wings as an adult typically. Um, early instar nymphs are called crawlers. So this for scales is actually the mobile stage. Um, the rest of their life cycle, they're largely immobile. So here's an image of what that looks like. You can see a, a mature adult that's uh, reproduced, and then all these first instar nymphs are crawlers and are dispersing to different points of the host plant. Uh, this is the stage in which they're usually most susceptible to management and uh, other environmental factors. Another example of crawlers. So here you've got several life stages on the same leaf uh, with eggs, crawlers, and then uh, some nymphs and complete adults. So females typically have three instars and they progress, so they would progress through three instars and then uh, become reproductive where males typically have five. So in this image, this would be uh, a male. And the males may also have a prepupal stage if they actually become a wing form. So it's the males uh, that disperse over long distances. So scales are actually one of the most abundant and diverse groups of sap sucking insects. Uh, with the sumer, within the superfamily Coxoidea. They're well-known agricultural pests, but they're also important in forestry. In some cases, um, they're actually also used as biological control a, uh, uh, agents of invasive plants. So a good example of that is the uh, prickly pear cactus. So Puntia species are highly invasive in Australia. Um, the cochineal scale is, is a great biological control agent uh, for those cacti and is very able to kill them. So um, while they're typically pests, they also have some other uh, management value. So there's seven families that contain species that are important in forestry in the Western United States. These names are a little hard to say, but you have the Astrolocaneidae, the Coxidae, the Diaspididae, the Areococcidae, the Margarodiidae, the Pseudococcidae, and the Kermesidae. So we're gonna to focus today on just the coxidae and the diaspididae. That's the soft scales and the armored scales, which uh, most of which uh, comprise the largest amount of the, the pest species that we're concerned about. So the scale itself is actually a protective covering that hides the body. And this can, in some instances, make the insect very difficult to see and may even be mistaken uh, for fungi or some other type of lichenous growth. For example, in this bottom right uh, figure, oftentimes people don't actually recognize that that's a scale insect. <clears throat> Whereas the soft bodied scales, um, so these are armored scales and the soft bodied scales tend to be a little more uh, obvious uh, that they're not you know, plant growth or something like that. So the protective wax uh, that forms on the dor dorsal and ventral surface is what comprises the scale. And this is actually called the test. And the test is what makes scale insects so difficult to control because it makes them largely resistant to a variety of chemical treatments uh, as well as biological control agents. So when we're talking about soft scales and armored scales, um, they differ a bit in the construction and attachment of the scale to the actual insect body. So the coating that's secreted is a waxy or chitinous substance uh, that's comprised of these large molecules of unsaturated hydrocarbons, including fatty acids. In armored scales, um, the scale or the test is actually distinct from the body of the insect. So here in this image, you can see the, the insect body, uh, eggs, and then this dorsal and ventral covering of the scale that covers its entire body. Uh, in soft scales, the, the waxy secretion actually becomes attached strongly to the insect cuticle and is really part of the body and, it, and it's primarily dorsal. So they're not protected underneath. Um, they're really just protected on top. 
So if, if you're able to extract a scale and examine um, uh, the, the dorsal and ventral surface, that's one easy way to distinguish between whether you're looking at a soft scale or an armored scale. So this waxy structure is actually secreted by an organ called pygidium. Um, and this is interesting because it's actually a fused section of sclerotized posterior segments in the abdomen. So this structure sort of near the anal opening is the pygidium. Uh, and it's, it's made up of all these little micro ducts and macro ducts, which secrete the wax onto the surface of the insect. And um, there's all these little ducts and openings of different shapes and sizes in the pygidium that secrete that waxy substance. And that is uh, what creates the armor for the scale. So another easy um, trait that you can use to distinguish between scales is looking at their basic body form. So armored scales generally have two forms. Uh, they can be elongate. So here you can see that they're sort of long and, and uh, narrow, or they'll be very circular. Whereas the soft scales are almost always sort of ovoid or shaped, you know, shaped like an oval. So that's another easy way to distinguish between these two types. Um, they differ in their reproductive patterns as well. So armored scales are typically sexually reproducing, whereas soft scales uh, can reproduce sexually, but most often are reproducing parthenogenetically. So that, that's clonally. Um, they differ in fecundity as well, where uh, females of the armored scales may produce several dozen eggs, but typically less than 100. So they're you know, highly fecund, but not prolifically so. Whereas armored scale, um, oh, sorry, soft scales can produce hundreds to even thousands of eggs, thousands of clones of themselves in their lifetime. So the population growth rate of, of these soft scales can really be just astounding and can make them very effective um, uh, pests of trees. Um, another distinction is that armored scales are mostly immobile during their life stage, uh, except for that crawler stage where they, they might may migrate within the canopy of a tree or up and down the bowl of a tree. Soft scales can remain more mobile, so they're able to move around a little bit. Recall that that uh, ventral surface is not covered, so they actually have contact with their, their legs to the, the plant surface, and they can move. They don't like to, but they can and they may migrate during their lifetime uh, between plant organs. So they may move from foliage to twigs or to nodes of branches. And here's just a, a, a scanning electron micrograph of a soft scale crawler. So you can see even at that early life stage, how sort of flattened and um, uh, compressed they are, which again, can make them difficult to even damage uh, physically. Much like a tick. When you press on them or try to crush them, they don't, they're, they're sort of soft bodied and they don't easily uh, give way. Their, their exoskeleton is very tough. So um, they differ a bit in their phenologies as well. Soft scales typically produce crawlers for several weeks in the spring and summer, and then armored scales will produce crawlers for a week or two in the spring. So if you see crawlers, noting the time of the year that it is can also help you distinguish between is it an armored scale or is it a soft scale? And that distinction you'll see a little bit later is important for um, the control methods that you might choose. So it's, it's very important to distinguish between which of these two uh, groups you're, you're seeing. So let's go a, li a little bit over the development. If you recall, males and females have a different um, number of instars that they progress through. And that is because males tend to be the, the long distance dispersers. So if we're thinking about a female, um, they usually begin to develop their, their uh, waxy secretions or their tests after that crawler stage. And then that will grow uh, significantly by second larval instar. And then at the third uh, instar, 
females are usually sexually mature and they will have a crawl or flap under which either eggs or uh, neonates are contained protected. So they, they actually exhibit um, sort of a crude form of parental care. So that's the female. Uh, on the other side, oh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so here's just another drawing of what that looks like on that dorsal and ventral surface. So you can see that that, that flap uh, actually covers her eggs. And if you can remove that and, and see both the insect body and the, the eggs and crawlers uh, protected underneath the, the, the test. So that's just kind of a, a neat to see. Now, if we're looking at the males, um, they don't develop quite as um, significant of a test because they're not containing eggs underneath. And by the second instar, they'll either differentiate into a dispersal stage or into a, a feeding type of uh, life stage. And which case, if they're going to be dis, uh, dispersing, they will um, form a prepupa. So they're not very common in the population and they can remain as a sessile form that just feeds, hangs out um, near the females or developed a, a winged form and, and actually migrate away uh, for genetic recombination. So the adult male um, has five larval instars and may be uh, actually dispersing. In terms of their feeding, um, they have piercing sucking mouth parts, the sternorica do, uh, similar to aphids. So the mouth parts are used to access solid plant tissues and um, actually directly access phloem contents. So here's just a diagram of the covering of the mouth part. So here's the sheath or labium that protects it. And then within that, there's these muscular structures that allow them to actually move the stylet up and down, and the stylet itself uh, contains food and salivary ducts. So they'll also secrete uh, saliva into the plant tissues, which helps uh, to provide some enzymatic action and break up um, some of the defenses and break up some of the um, in, uh, proteins and things that they're interested in. Here's just a scanning electron micrograph of stylet. So you can see they're very tiny um, maybe on the order of one to three millimeters. This is a rather large one, uh, but they can be quite small as well. <laughs> so I think that here's an example of another cross section uh, from another electron micrograph. So here's that muscle tissue uh, and then the actual feeding canal and the salivary canal. So that feeding canal is quite large uh, in comparison. So here's an image, this is actually an aphid, but here's an image of what that stylet feeding looks like. Uh, there are some advantages to this type of feeding because they can actually bypass many of the cells and they feed in an intracellular space so the, the stylet will move in between cells, they're extremely sensitive, and then they can just plug directly into the phloem ducts of the plant tissue. So one of the advantages of this uh, is that it actually allows them to bypass a number of plant defenses. So um, by not damaging the scleroderm or any of these sort of external cells, they, they can uh, bypass a number of defenses that gives them an advantage and allows them to, uh, to gain quite large populations in some cases. And here's the, the phloem bundle there. So soft scales feed primarily on the phloem cells. You'll see in a, a moment that they have, they can be sort of analogized to uh, uh, oil drillers that just go directly into the oil uh, uh, repository and draw that directly up. So that's, that's the feeding style for soft scales. Um, soft scale feeding, also typically will result in the production of honeydew. So uh, here you can see honeydew collecting on the surface of leaves where soft scales have been feeding. This can be quite a nuisance and have some unexpected secondary effects. So uh, the production of the honeydew in a lot of cases is actually more of a nuisance than the 
feeding of the insects themselves. Um, a large population may not really significantly damage uh, a robust mature host tree, but the production of that honeydew can be pretty nasty in some cases. So anyone who's parked under a, a, a tree that's infested with sap feeding insects like aphids or scales in the summertime um, has probably had this happen to them where their car will become covered in honeydew. There are even products that have been specifically designed uh, in order to remove that because as you also know, this stuff can be really hard to get off once you um, get it on bonded to the surface of your car and it can become sort of sooty and, and nasty. So that's uh, in urban areas, a major issue for a lot of people. It can be expensive to, to uh, manage. Some other secondary effects of honeydew that are interesting to think about are uh, tending by ants. So ants will often form impromptu symbiotic or mutualistic relationships with sap feeding insects like aphids. Ant aphid mutualisms are well understood, but they will, they will do the same thing with scales. So here is the odorous house ant tapping on the sessile, uh, tending to scales uh, which are producing honeydew, tending to soft body scales. So the issue with this is that plants that become infested by scales uh, can serve as a food source for ants, um, and if that's you know near your home or in an urban environment, it can actually create a situation where you may have ant pests, house ants that um, are retained for a longer period or become extremely difficult to eradicate. And you know anybody who um, has left food out in the kitchen at the wrong time or on, falls on the floor or has dogs or kids or whatever, these house ants can be just impossible to eradicate. So having a scale population uh, on, on trees nearby can, can make them even more difficult to eradicate, um, which is just an interesting bit of ecology. Another thing, uh, this is a complete aside, but the odorous house ant smells like blue cheese if you crush it. So if you are ever um, just curious about ant ID, you can grab a little house ant and crush it and smell it. If it smells like blue cheese, that's a positive ID for, uh, for the odorous house ant. Another thing that is uh, aesthetic, um, but also has effects on plant growth, is a colonization of the, the honeydew by sooty molds. So this is a couple of different fungal species that can cause this. So sooty mold itself is actually a colonization of the honeydew by Cladosporia or Alternaria, both of which are plant pathogens. Um, they're also just ubiquitous opportunistic fungi, and, and they may not really uh, you know, this colonization may not directly result in pathogenic effects on the plant, but it can reduce photosynthesis uh, and, and send slow plant growth. So here's an example of sooty mold, uh, cross section of sooty mold on a palm leaf. And you see that that fungal um, my, mycelium grows right over the leaf surface. Obviously that can uh, reduce thing, reduce chlorophyll and carotenoid output. Uh, and photosynthetic, photosynthetic output. So this is largely an aesthetic issue, but in, in agricultural species like palm, um, it can also reduce outputs. Uh, so this, this can be a more important issue in like tree fruit situations um, and for growers. So sooty mold is a major concern for growers, but uh, yeah, mostly aesthetic for homeowners. Here's just an example of sooty molds forming on a variety of species. So here it's, you know, sooty mold forming on a, a pine. Here it's uh, just forming on, I think, the leaves of a, of a basswood, if I'm correct about that, or a cottonwood, and on holly. And it can even, you know, a heavy scale infestation can cause the deposition of honeydew and secondary colonization by sooty mold all over the bark. So, you know, you'll, you'll see changes in the coloration of the bark. And this is an example of some large elm trees on the CSU campus. This is just about, um, you know, a couple hundred yards from where I'm sitting right now. And, and you know, people can bit, get rather alarmed, like what's going on here. Um, and it's actually probably because of either scale or aphid infestation. 
<clears throat> and not actually some damage to the tree itself. I don't believe this causes any structural damage, but can be unsightly. The armored scales, in contrast to the direct feeding of soft-bodied scales, typically feed on cell contents, usually in the cam cambium or parenchyma. So here are the vascular bundles uh, in a helianthus stem, and uh, soft-bodied scales would be feeding on the phloem, whereas armored scales would feed in that cambial layer or potentially even into the xylem layer. So uh, one benefit of that, I guess, from a management perspective is that that doesn't result in the excretion of honeydew. So soft-bodied scales, um, you know, can be more uh, of an urban pest. And here's just a vascular bundle again, showing differentiation between phloem, vascular cambium, and xylem. So the armored scales will actually feed directly on these cell contents rather than bypassing all these cells with the stylet and then plugging into that uh, phloem, um, conductive canal. So here's what, what I was referring to a few minutes ago um, with the, the sort of difference, uh, an analogy and the difference in the way that soft scales and armored scales feed. So the soft scale inserts the stylet directly into the phloem layer, uh, whereas the armored scale is more like uh, a fracking type of operation. So for the for the soft scales, the path of the stylet is perpendicular to the plant surface. It goes directly down. In the armored scale, it bypasses those um, intercellular spaces as well, but then actually curves underneath uh, parallel to the plant surface. So the, the feeding stylet of the armored scale is in fact uh, parallel to the plant surface when they're actually feeding. I think this is a good way to remember that. So, uh, that's the basics of scale ecology. Let's just briefly review how to distinguish between armored scales and soft scales. So the soft scales have this leathery exoskeleton that can be removed, whereas the uh, armored scales uh, have a waxy test covering, that, and it's called the test rather than the, the covering actually being part of the exoskeleton. They differ in shape, and they're elongate uh, or, or very circular, and they're, tight, they're quite small, so they're under an eight dimension size, so tiny. Whereas the soft scales, by comparison, are, are, are large, greater than an eighth of an inch, and they tend to be ovoid in shape. They differ in their fecundity, so the, rep, the reproductive rates of armored scales is in the dozens to maybe up to 100, but that's unusual where soft scales reproduce uh, parthenogenetically and can produce hundreds of thousands of individuals per female. So extremely fecund, and extremely high growth potential. Um, their mobility stages differ. So only the crawlers are mobile for armored scales, whereas certain adults can also be mobile for the soft scale, particularly the males. Their activity timing, timing uh, differs. So crawlers are present in spring for armored scales and they're more likely present in late summer for the soft-bodied scales. They differ in their feeding habits uh, with feeding perpendicular to the plant surface versus feeding um, parallel to the plant surface with the stylet and then the production of honeydew. So armored scales really don't produce honeydew and soft scales do. So this little diagnostic should be a, a pretty robust way for just looking at something and quickly determining uh, which of these two groups you're working with. Uh, another thing the bears mention is they're extremely adapted to their hosts and very small differences in host physiology can affect their reproductive output. So contrary to what we see for like bark and wood boring beetles where Drought stress is uh, beneficial to those insects and reduces tree defenses. By contrast with the uh, scales, tree water potential actually has to be maintained at a, a certain uh, level in order for them to be successful. So too dry is bad and their populations can crash in drought stress situations. There are a number of uh, natural enemies that do a, a pretty good job of controlling uh, scale populations, particularly parasitoid wasps. So we'll look at some pictures of that and how you can determine um, just generally whether or not your 
scale population may really be under control by natural enemies already. Uh, they can become highly locally adapted to tree chemistry. In fact, uh, there were some very, uh, I don't know, seminal studies, I guess, early on in understandings of insect adaptation that were focusing on scales and pine trees. And they can even become so locally adapted that they're really adapted only to one or a few hosts in the area. So um, that business of switching between hosts can actually be a maladaptive trait for, for certain scales. They're sensitive to fungi on the plant surface, but they can also create uh, a situation for fungal colonization of the plant surface. And then they, they may uh, typically feed on only one plant type and, and plant organ. And then they're highly susceptible to intraspecific comp competition as well. So when their densities become very high, their population growth rates will typically slow. Likewise, if there are other more mobile sap feeding insects like aphids present, um, they can be outcompeted and, and have a population crash as well. And then actually uh, dust on the plant surfaces is, is um, maladaptive for scales as well. And they don't attach very well. They don't like dusty plants. So um, let's move on to discussing some specific pests. So first we'll talk about three species in the Diaspididae, uh, the San Jose scale, the oyster shell scale, and then the pine needle scale. So San Jose scale is mostly on rosaceae and can be an agricultural pest. The oyster shell scale uh, tends to feed on shrubs and hardwoods, and the pine needle scale tends to feed on conifers. And again, I have listed uh, Colorado because that was what I was focusing on the last time I gave this talk, but. Uh, these, these species are all over the Western United States. So the San Jose scale has quite a scientific name, Quadraspidiosis perniciosis. Uh, and the scientific name literally comes from the word pernicious, which means harmful, especially in a gradual or subtle way, which indeed they are. Uh, they first gained a lot of notice by growers because they caused agricultural damage to a variety of rosaceous species, plums, pears, cherries, peaches, and even nut trees. Uh, they can kill trees in very high abundances, but their primary, primary mode of action as a pest on rosaceous species is that they actually directly damage fruits. So they can feed on the fruit directly, uh, which reduces its saleability. And most growers can't sell their, their fruit if there's even a, a very small uh, level of infestation. So these were first found in the Rocky Mountains in 1890s, but earlier than that in California, hence the name. Here you can see some direct damage to apples. And it's basically on every continent except Antarctica and can be moved uh, around via movement of infested fruits. So the adult female is yellow but it's covered with these um, rounded gray scales that can be up to two millimeters. So here's a male that's moving around, a winged morph. Um, and they are polyphagous, so they can infest hundreds of, of different species of trees. They're everywhere. And again, they're often mistaken for fungal growth. Um, they're bored viviparously, so it's live birth. And then the males can be monitored with pheromone traps. So there is a good way for, for looking for these. Here are the pheromone names. I won't try to uh, pronounce these live, but um, they're very cheap. And so a monitoring operation is a, is a nice way to control these. Their life cycle is such that uh, the nymphs will be present various times throughout the year, but by monitoring in June or July, the crawlers can be detected and um, management can be applied as appropriate. In our area, they have two generations per year and they overwinter as nymphs. And then the growth and movement resumes once the temperature increases about above about 50. So there are some very good degree day models for um, timing up when you actually look for these scales and different life stages. And um, you may, you know, once you hit this sort of six or 700 degree uh, day biofix, that would be a good time to apply sprays targeting the control of the crawlers. So um, hopefully this resource will be just made available to you and you, and you can go through the PowerPoint if, if need be to, to look at these guidelines. Um, 
Crawlers of all species can be monitored really inexpensively just using sticky tape. So here's a, a slide from one of Whitney Cranshaw's presentations. And the important thing about using the, the selection of tape is that you wanna choose a color that contrasts against the color of the scale crawler body. So if they're light colored, use black tape, if they're dark colored, use white tape. And if you're not sure, uh, clear tape will suffice. So this is you know, a, a couple of pennies to produce a, um, a couple of pennies to produce a, a trap for monitoring. So another uh, big player is the oyster shell scale, Lepidosaphes ulmi. Uh, in our area in the Rocky Mountains, this is extremely damaging. And you can see why it's named the oyster shell scale because it quite literally uh, looks like an oyster, just a very, very small one. Uh, in our area, regional hosts include Aspen, primarily in Willow, but in other places like California with a more diverse hardwood uh, community, they can infest pretty much any of any of the hardwoods uh, and are commonly found on box elder, alder, and dogwood. So these uh, scales were introduced probably in the 1700s along with settlers moving firewood. Um, the mature scales are two to three millimeters. So, you know, this is, um, I don't know, about the size of a grain of rice, maybe even smaller. And heavy infestations often look like fungal growth and people aren't sure what they are. And, and they impart this uh, sort of uh, mottled surface to the bark and it, it can be quite textured. And, and uh, we'll look at a picture of that in a minute. So their crawlers appear in May or June and there may be one generation, uh, up to two generations per year, probably in California and uh, more temperate areas. So you, you, you can see an example of an infestation here on, um, I believe this is on an aspen, and you get this kind of in completely encrusted surface, really gross looking, and they, they've attached really firmly, so firmly that they can even remain on um, the surface after the tree has died. It's sort of maladaptive that they can't just disperse and move, but um, they're, they're really difficult to get off of there and they're really well protected. So from a distance, uh, here's some aspen trees that are heavily infested. Um, you, you can see this discoloration, and this is not from the honeydew production. This is actually from uh, just an extremely high population abundance of the scales themselves. And this can also create gradual uh, bark cracking and degradation, which can then lead to things like secondary fungal infections and so on. So there's sort of a cascade of things that can happen to a hardwood when it becomes really heavily infested with the oyster shell scale. Um, let's move on to the pine needle scale. So here's just a close up view. Again, they're very tiny of uh, the pine needle scale, several different life stages. So here you have immatures, uh, mature females and crawlers all present together. So here's your early instars, mature females, and then dispersing crawlers. Uh, the adult females about three millimeters long, dark orange, and, and the body is typically wingless. So the total size can reach up to eight millimeters. So by comparison, these pine needle scales are really uh, quite a bit larger than the oyster shell scale or the San Jose scale. The males are tiny, um, but they're almost never present. So uh, these populations are almost entirely clonal. And as I mentioned, they can become extremely locally adapted. So um, infestations don't tend to become very widespread because they become really adapted to the chemistry of the individual trees. Uh, the crawlers are purple to red brown and the eggs can be sort of a rust colored and are deposited underneath the armor covering. So recall that these females are gravid and as they're feeding here, there's just a bunch of eggs underneath that protective flap. So here's an example of a pine needle scale infestation. Um, this is also very often mistaken for a fungal infection. And in fact, that's what it looks like because you see this sort of white growth all along the, the needles of these trees. And they can infest most conifers in their range pine, spruces, firs, Douglas firs, and even, even cedars. Um, so really any gymnosperm is susceptible and it's important to take a look really closely 
when you see something like this to try to determine is it is it a scale or is it is it uh, actually fungal growth so usually on closer examination you can see these are little tiny insects uh, they're also common in mugo pine which is a common landscape species and like to really take off in shelter belt planting so that's a good place to look for them Here we have two generations per year. Um, and again, here's just a picture of, of all of those eggs underneath the, the test flap. Females lay 20 to 30 eggs in the fall and they actually overwinter with the mother. So this is pretty advanced uh, parental care for such a, a relatively uh, primitive insect. The egg hatch occurs in the spring once temperatures warm up around 50 and um, uh, they, they may start actually crawling in June. Then after the crawlers settle, the feeding nymphs lose appendages and their eyes during successive molts, so they're actually blind. Um, they're so sessile that they have no need to move or to see anything. Uh, and the infestations tend to be localized in tree crowns. So you, it, you, you'll typically find it just on one spot in the tree where the conditions are very good, where it may be a, a, a shady spot or something like that, but not often throughout the entire crown. So some signs and symptoms of infestation, obviously, you know, it's an obvious sign if you see eggs and adults present on needles, but from a distance, this can manifest as dieback of older needles. So they, you won't usually find them on the newest year's growth. You could see in all three of these pictures, I think pinion pine and maybe Austrian pine here, um, the damage is most evident on the older growth. So that's uh, just sort of an obvious field um, identification characteristic. So let's move on with the last uh, 10 minutes or so here to talking about general methods of scale control. There may be uh, a need for integrated options um, in order to achieve true control, because again, they're, they're difficult to control with a uh, number of insecticides. So you want to consider whether they're already under natural control. Uh, the application of some fungal agents are useful. There are cultural controls, like obviously um, physical removal and or um, choosing planting species carefully, and then some chemical controls. So natural controls tend to be either coccinella beetles or a variety of um, parasitoids. There's three coccinella beetles that will feed on scales and they're extremely small. So they're difficult to see and are often missed. Here's an example of a hyperaspis beetle feeding directly on an adult scale. And you'll see that they uh, will punch a hole through the test and can eat the eggs as well. So um, here are the three main groups there are tiny black beetles around two to four millimeters in size, so not much larger than the scale itself. Uh, another thing that needs to be considered is whether they're actually being tended by ants. So if ants are tending to the scales, this is likely to actually prevent control by natural enemies because the ants will extirpate them from the plant surface. So if you have a situation where the ants are feeding on them, you may need to control the ants prior to uh, assuming any natural controls would be effective. Uh, parasitic wasps are also very common, and there's a couple of species that are commercially available for release, um, but typically natural populations are sufficient. So from anywhere, you know, when you're working with a homeowner, anywhere from 50 to $500 uh, can get you uh, parasitic wasps that can, can be released. So there's a number of important um, taxa, including aphidus, coxophagus, and metaphycus, and they don't have immediate results. So if you're going to um, propone a control method like this, um, it may take several years in order to actually see any documentable effect. So here's a couple of examples of what that looks like. Um, one of the really obvious signs of parasitism is in these uh, soft-bodied scales, you'll see just a lot of them with holes punched in them by the emerging wasp. Here's a wasp feeding directly on or ovipositing directly on a San Jose scale and a coxophagus wasp uh, parasitizing a scale insect as well. 
So if you look carefully, particularly if you're talking about armored scales um, and you see lots of little holes in the adults, then that's a pretty good indication uh, that natural control may already be functioning and you may not need to do much. So again, the, the scale bodies won't fall off of the, the needle surface or off of the plant surface. But if you're seeing, you know, 70, 50 to 70 percent of these uh, individuals showing signs of parasitism, then probably you don't really need to do anything for the health of the plant. There's also some biologicals that are available. Uh, a common one is Botanigard, which is an entomopathogenic fungus, Bovaria bassiana. And this can be formulated as sprays, drenches, or even spot applications. Um, we've played with this stuff in the lab a lot, and it's pretty effective. But the important thing to remember is that they don't work on armored scales. This will work on soft-bodied scales, but the test is simply too protective um, for the fungal hyphae to penetrate the cuticle insect. So here's an example of some control. Um, when the test has been removed, it's extremely effective um, or lifted, it's very effective, but on an intact armored scale, there's very little control uh, possible with Botanigard, but you can see that they do readily colonize the soft-bodied scales. So here's hyphae growing all out of uh, an infected soft-bodied scale. One of the most effective controls, particularly for oyster shell scale, is just physical removal. So if it's, if it's a purely a cosmetic issue and not a plant health issue, um, just a good stiff scrubber like you can buy at uh, you know, Home Depot or the grocery store uh, can be used to just remove them physically. So you, you have to be a little bit careful to brush stiffly enough to actually disconnect the scales from the plant surface. Um, but you don't want to gouge and damage the bark. So this can you know, maybe be something you don't want a child to do, but uh, is, is a pretty easy way to remove an infestation that's small in your backyard. Uh, there's a variety of chemical controls, but they vary greatly in efficacy. Uh, and you need to think about a couple of things. So timing is important. Uh, you're going to have your best effect if you apply a chemical uh, during the crawler stage. So you need to have a regular monitoring program if this is a, an approach you want to take. Um, we need to consider off-target applications. So if you're actually knocking down the natural enemy population, this isn't really very valuable. Um, resistance, so they can quickly uh, form pesticide resistance. The European Elm scale is a great example of this, at which point, you know, an integrated method that's using um, chemical applications is probably impossible. And then there's some specificity to armored scales versus soft bodied scales. So different products work on uh, the different life uh, forms. So here's just an example of uh, some of the known applications that work. Uh, so certain things like insecticidal soaps and imidacloprid really aren't going to be very effective on armored scales, um, but could be on soft scales. Um, the two best products are probably py pyroproxifen and uh, cetamiprid, which can bring populations under control uh, quite quickly. So the rainbow has several of these products available. Um, which are probably effective like a uh, proxite. Here's an example of um, uh, the reduction of parasitoids. So off-target effects. The only one that doesn't have off-target effects is dinotefron. These other uh, chemicals like bifenthrin, uh, pyroproxifen uh, have, have some significant off-target effects and can actually reduce the natural control of efficacy. So when you apply a uh, spray across the whole tree, these residues can remain for some time to which parasitoids are very highly sensitive. So again, consider those off-target effects before you uh, pursue a chemical control method. More effective tends to be treatment that's uh, really limited to specific areas of the bark in the lower trunk. And those type of applications tend to minimize impacts on your off targets. Uh, 
And here's just an example of a basal trunk spray with uh, uh, Ron. And again, uh, Rainbow has some of these products available. So I think I'm right on time. Uh, this is my last slide. So here's a couple of uh, links to various extension websites and documents that can help uh, with determining you know, uh, different applications and timings and, and some other diagnostics as needed. Uh, I'll try to make this presentation available publicly so that you can go through it on your own if you want to look at any of the diagnostics or recommendations that, that I made. So I will stop there. And I think that gives us a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, thanks, Seth. That was great. Um... Allison, one question I'll have for you is whether sure. we could just make the presentation, uh, you know, available somehow yep. so that folks are able to access it on, on their own. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is, well, we usually send out the recording to everyone who attended. But if you want to send me the PDF version of your slide deck, mm -hmm. um, then we can include that, too. And then we may have a way to link it on, you know, because we put it on our website with your recording. So we may have a way to link it there. And Matt, who is on um can help us out with that oh we do have a question yes. can you speak to the carryover of dino tefran into the next season yeah so i think that you're likely to get to you know some of the research i've looked at is you're likely to get two years of control out of dino tefran application um, and again that would be my recommended uh, chemistry just because it tends to have a reduced effect on the parasitoid population. Yeah, so I will speak to some of our data too, is we we typically see that the, um, with all of our, you know, we take all the samples to figure out where, how much it stays in the plant material. And we typically see it starts to wane after about 120 days. But that being said, efficacy, if the population is moderate enough, we will see two years of control just because you knock it back hard enough um, and then it ends up working. So. Uh, so Dawn has followed up with a question about pollinators. And this is actually a, yeah. a great question, Dawn, um, because one of the things that we're finding, and we're actually researching the, the effects of, of uh, a variety of chemistries on bees, and one of the things we're finding is that in many cases, it's in fact the surfactant uh, that you choose, which is having a greater effect than the chemistry itself. So, um, you know, so far, none of them are have been shown to be great, um, but. Uh, I'll have to think about my data a little bit, but typically it's actually the surfactant, which is, is the most important in uh, having negative effects on bees. Now, I would say for control of tree scales, this isn't likely to be as much of a problem unless it's uh, like a rosacea, a rosaceae species that is producing lots of blooms, like fruit trees, um, but in forest trees, like most hardwoods and um, conifers, you know, bees won't visit them, so I wouldn't be very concerned. Um, but in fruit trees, I think that that's where you, you would want to consider that most. Yeah, and I will say too, having been an applicator out there, it also depends on how you're doing the application, right? Because you know, you're saying dinotepherin, but you can also apply that via bark spray or a spray in the air or a soil application or trunk injected. So all of those are going to have different implications on your pollinators um, too. So lots of considerations. Oh, good. We got quite a few questions coming in. All right. Treatments for Kermes scale on oaks, which I think you pretty much covered that, but. Yeah, um, and and so the Kermes scale, we didn't talk about uh, today, but it is, a, um, it is a significant issue in our area. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not familiar what some of the, um, what the control options are for it. So I, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it um allison maybe you maybe yeah you're we see that. actually pretty good control on kermy scale if you can time it with your um with the crawler stage using pyroproxifen which is great because that's you know that's our proxite but it works really well um because the uh, crawler stage is really susceptible um systemics in conjunction with that work but yeah we see a lot of problems with it what i will say about kermy scale is you may need to um do a couple of years of application before you start to get get control of that. 
And then there was a question from Shoham, uh, is the Elm scale soft or armored scale? So the European Elm scale is a soft bodied scale. Um, and then I don't know which scale we're referring to, but do they attack eucalyptus and do they bite? Jeremiah, if you wanna pop in and let us know which scale you're talking about. Um, but my guess is they don't bite, but who knows? They, do not, they don't bite. Uh, their, their mouth parts are only adapted to feed intracellularly uh, on plant tissue. So a bite is not possible from the scale. Um, any scale specifically that attack eucalyptus? I am not sure of that. I think there is a eucalyptus scale, um, but I don't know much about them, um, so I won't. I won't speak to that. I think there is a there is a, sp a specific eucalyptus scale. So in California, that might be an issue. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Um, okay. All right. Best time to treat for soft scale in Oklahoma? I use an acetate injection. Well, it depends what scale you're talking about. So Michael, if you have specifics, let us know. Yeah, and I mean soft scale, and I think talking about the, the kind of um, uh, the kind of tree is important as well, but probably something like um, proxite is, is very effective. So your pyroproxifens will work well for a soft scale. Absolutely. Um, and then, okay, we have a specific question, triase and systemic treatment on European ELM scale. Do you have an update on the European ELM scale data, Seth, at all? I know Whitney I, had left some of that off, but yeah, he handed not, it over. I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't get handed those trials, so I'm not sure what, uh, the, what the status of that is, but I can certainly look into it and, uh, and try to provide some some info for you, Allison, if you want to share it with your group of stakeholders. Yeah, and I had been looped in at one point, but then when Whitney retired, I kind of got left out of the loop similarly. Um, and I know we had had some good luck with, actually, MMECT and Benzoate, I think, was helping. But then we had some trials, obviously, using other are more like neonicotinoids, but then we were seeing resistance with it. So um, we can help provide an update on that, certainly. Okay, and then we've got just, I think, sorry, they're coming in a couple different waves. Yeah. In terms of mode of action for scale, um, is there one that's best or and would it be for soft or armored? So these are very broad. Yeah, I mean, that's really hard to say because I think it, in, in thinking about that, um, you know, we have a lot of things to consider, right? Like the species, the tree species, the, the level of the infestation uh, is it, is it economic, uh, like agricultural level of infestation, or is this just in the backyard? Um, I would probably, in general, um, favor the, the pyroproxifens just because it's a, ju a juvenile hormone mimic. So, I mean, that's going to have broad uh, mode of action. Yep, we agree. We think that that's great, obviously. Um, and I will say this, this is... Seth has all of this data, you know, he's the research guy. Rainbow also has a little bit more resources for you. If you have the specific pest and tree, or if you need help identifying it, let us know. It will come down to growing degree days. When are those crawlers emerging? Things like that. It's not these, this is really broad. We have a blanket statement of things that work, but the timing is really important. Rainbow has a ton of resources on their websites and you guys, please reach out to us directly or, you know, even to Seth or the cooperative extensions for where you live and we can help you hone in a little bit because we want to make sure that we're in good ecological integrity um, around this. Okay, Colin has a good comment. If you're seeing something on eucalyptus, it's most likely lerp psyllid and that biting insects are tortoise beetles. We got some smart people on here. So beetles can bite. That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. All right. And then let me see. Yeah, I think that's it. And we are at the top of the hour. So folks, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any uh, lingering questions. And we we will give you a little bit more information too as Rainbow um, on how you deal with some of your applications in the field on your homeowner property, things like that, right? Because there's almost like a stepping stone of information that goes like what you would use in agriculture versus what you would use in the forest versus what you would use on your client's property and what they're 
um, threshold for the pests are and things like that. So please know this is not just a one size fits all situation. And with that, thank you, Seth, for your time. And thank you, everyone else, for being here. We will send out the recording after. And there will be, um, what you call it, um, a survey. So if you want to take that, we'd appreciate it. With that, have a great day. Thank you.